I'm Chad Evan Collins, and this is the Marketing On Demand Show. I set out to answer the million dollar question. What is the biggest needle mover in your business and what drives people to buy faster than anything else? Through selling over $30 million of my own products and services and setting two Guinness World Records for ticket sales along the way, I discovered how to move the needle consistently and quickly. If you're a marketer, e-commerce seller, entrepreneur, or founder, join me as I reveal my exact strategies and see what today's smartest business leaders are doing right now to explode their sales. Do you want to learn how to boost your sales using these methods? Text the word DEMAND to 90851. That's DEMAND to 90851. Now, here's the show. How's it going, everyone? Chad Evan Collins here, your host of the Marketing On Demand show, where we feature top marketers, entrepreneurs, and brands about the strategies, tactics, and tools they're using right now to move the needle in their business. And this moment, we have the honor of chatting with Steve Ulsher. And I'm going to bring Steve in and tell you a little bit about my man, Steve is a 30 plus year entrepreneur, founder and editor in chief of Podcast Magazine, original founder of Liquor.com, creator of the New Media Summit and host of top rated podcasts, Reinvention Radio and Beyond Eight Figures. He's an international keynote speaker and in-demand strategic coach who helps businesses of all sizes leverage the power of new media to generate visibility, leads, and revenue on autopilot. Steve, welcome to the Marketing On Demand show. I guess I should change the bio to say On Demand, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so I know we, we talked a bit about, about jumping in, our jumping off point as your kind of entry into entrepreneurship. But as, as I'm thinking now about podcasting and your experience in podcasting, when it comes to you know, the awareness component of marketing on demand from, you know, building a brand for yourself or building a, ba- a brand for your business. Where do you, where is podcasting's place in awareness-based marketing? Yeah, you know, man, I uh, I, I will say this, which is, I believe, and, and I'll say this as, as clear and, and succinctly as I possibly can, I believe that if you are in business today, you need to have a podcast, period, end story, right? I mean, if it's, it's kind of like how books used to be the fancy business card of the day, right? I mean, every coach or author or speaker or solopreneur or holistic practitioner or whatever. I mean, if you really wanted to have credibility and authority and, uh, you know, just really establish yourself as that go-to expert, whatever that means to you in the space, you needed a book, right? I mean, that was that was the thing for a while and it's still the thing to, to a large extent. Uh, but, you know, look, as, as we shift into this new media economy that uh, we've been in now for quite some time, but even to some, it still feels very embryonic. I will say that a, a podcast is one of those uh, one of those tools in the toolbox uh, that, that you're really missing a fairly big opportunity on in terms of taking advantage of what's available to you if you don't have one, or at the very least, uh, if you're not appearing as a guest on uh, on shows once, twice, three times, even you know every day per week. Yeah, um, that's huge. It's interesting because you are starting to see now podcasts become more mainstream than they ever have been in the past. There are professional sure. athletes. Uh, I know today I heard, I think Kevin Durant um, now has his own podcast yeah. where, where he brings in his basketball buddies and other pop culture rap stars just to have on to ultimately, yeah. I believe, build his brand because he's thinking about what happens after basketball for me. Yeah, super smart. And, you know, I mean, Kevin's been playing around in venture capital and doing things outside of basketball for for quite some time. And so th- there's a lot of reasons to have a podcast. There's a lot of reasons to be a guest on podcasts. Uh, but certainly when, when you're looking at things from an overall branding standpoint, I mean, you know this with the show. I mean, look, you're, you're doing it now, right? I mean, it's it's video and we're doing it the way that we're doing it. But nevertheless, it's still a show, right? And and I know you see the benefit of what happens when you invite somebody on to the show. It just gives you access to people you might normally not have access to. Um, and it gives you, of course, the opportunity to just say, hey, you know, if you're looking for a person who does X really, really well, uh, I'm your guy. And so it, it doesn't take much in order of, well, if you think about it from a business standpoint in terms of having 
really great conversations with highly targeted leads and those leads who ultimately can become clients. It doesn't take a huge show, whether it's a podcast or vid, you know, vidcast or whatever you want to call it or otherwise, to really move the needle for most entrepreneurs. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm curious. Now you have a podcast magazine. You've done, you've had several entrepreneurial ventures. Um, but st sticking with the podcast theme here for a minute, at what point did you decide, I believe there needs to be a publication around the niche of podcasts? And what yeah. was it like getting that off the ground? Yeah. So uh, I'd like to sit here and say that this was something that I had thought about for a long time and, and, you know, and just was like sitting on it and stewing on this, that, and the other. Literally from the moment I had the idea to the day that we launched uh, our first issue was under 100 days. And so what, what I knew to be true was that there was growth in the podcast arena. And I've been a podcaster since 2009, off and on, mostly on since 2015. But I knew there was a lot of good growth going on uh, in, you know, in the medium. And as a podcaster myself, uh, I've been able to, to surround you know, myself with people who have great shows, small, medium, large, et cetera, et cetera. And I've been really keeping my finger on the pulse of the industry uh, for quite some time. So if you if you look at the timing in terms of what we did and, and how we did it and when we launched and so on. So our first issue actually came out, uh, basically, let's just call it February 1st of 2020. And I'd already start to see a little bit of this hockey stick type growth going on in the medium, both in terms of the number of shows and in terms of the number of listeners. So Long story short, Chad, in answer to that question, I felt like there was a really good opportunity here to do something similar to what Wired did for tech or what Sports Illustrated did for sports. And, and by the way, now that we've released Podcast Magazine, the number of jokes we get around, you know, yeah, that's that's a brilliant business idea. Do a magazine about podcasts. Yeah. You know, so you can imagine some of the jokes that we get around that. But I, I felt like there was an opportunity to do something that was more lifestyle based and consumer facing because there were and there are some really decent uh, let's just call them industry rags that focus on the business of podcasting and 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 you know have great resources and so on for podcasters but there was nothing that was consumer facing taking you deeper into the lives of the podcasters you admire and deeper into the stories podcast fans can't get enough of and a podcast driven chart and independent ratings reviews you know and all that fun stuff that i thought would be a really great idea uh, and the, the, or uh, the origin, the real origin story, actually, I, I, and I always try to give credit as a teacher where credit is due the real origin story of the magazine. And, and by the way, we can just simply say that if you look at what took place here since COVID, I'd say our timing was pretty good because over 500,000 shows have come online in the last six months, which is a 50% increase in terms of the number of podcasts that are available. Incredible. But the original origin, origin, origin story uh, was I've been friends with, or I guess I would just say associates with uh, Brennan Burchard for a number of years. He actually spoke on my stage back in 2013, and I've followed his work for a long time. I was in uh, one of his events in October of 2019. I knew for a while he was talking about launching Influencer Magazine. He hadn't done anything with it, hadn't done anything with it. But in my mind, I was thinking it's just a really smart idea. You know, you sit down with influencers, get to interview them, get to meet them, put some on the cover. They then share their interviews, share their features with their big audiences and poof, you know, you've got a really decent brand. And so as I was sitting in the audience of one of his events uh, in October of 2019, it was actually called Influencer. And I saw one sign for Influencer Magazine, but knowing he hadn't done anything with it, I'm like, why is no one doing anything in the podcast space? And so that seed was really planted there. And I, you know, I give Brendan full credit. I wrote about it in one of my letters uh, from the editor. But yeah, I give him, I give him full credit for at least sparking that initiative in terms of, you know, hey, this is a really great idea for influencers. What's going on here in the podcast landscape? And literally right there on the spot. I looked up the domain, saw what was going on, because obviously, if you're going to do podcasts, you know, a magazine about podcasts, what else are you going to call it? So you got to call it Podcast Magazine. So like any, you know, modern day entrepreneur, I looked up the domain, looked up the URL to see what it was. And uh, and it was for sale. It was not being used. Uh, and it was one of those borderline prices where it was like, it's not an absolute no brainer, but it's not going to kill me either. So yeah, lo long answer to your question. I, I love that. I had a similar experience with marketingondemand.com. Right. It was like I knew I wanted to go marketing on demand. 
Um, it was owned by someone else, but it was right on that line after a little bit of back and forth, we were able to pull the trigger. Um, I love the idea of podcast magazine. It gives you and your staff the ability to edify these podcasters that have been in the game for such a long time. Everyone that is new coming into the space, either from a producer standpoint or from a listener standpoint, is going to very quickly realize um, and figure out who the pros are and who the hobbyists are, I guess, if you would. Um, and having a resource like this available, not only to the industry vets, but also to the listeners, um, is something that is going to help them on their journey, whether, whether it's I want to learn something about a specific topic on a podcast, or I'm sure there's tips and, and tricks that, that, you, that you highlight as well. Yeah, I mean, you do see some of that in the conversations that we have. I mean, this isn't one of those publications where we just kind of write these articles based on things that we read elsewhere. I mean, we actually sit down and interview all of the people that are featured in the magazine. So it, it, it's definitely been from an edification standpoint. I mean, it's been a great way to edify me and what I'm doing and our team and so on and so forth. I mean, I, I couldn't get Dave Ramsey to open the door. I couldn't get Adam Carolla to open the door, or Katie Couric or Jenna Kutcher, or I mean, you, you name it, based on the merits of what I was doing before. Now everybody opens their door. And I mean, that's a whole other discussion that we can have. But one of the things that I want to make really clear, Chad, and just in terms of marketing, uh, is if you're familiar with the podcast space at all, you know that discoverability is a huge issue, right? I mean, there's this ascending spiral in podcasting where basically popular shows remain popular because if you look at the charts, they're typically based on ratings and reviews and subscribes and downloads, right? So when someone new comes into the landscape of podcasting to find a show, where they go is they go to the charts, and when you see those shows that are on the charts, they're already there because they have ratings and reviews and subscribes and downloads. So somebody new comes, finds the show, listens to it, that adds to the downloads, maybe subscribes to it, adds to the subscribes, maybe they rate, maybe they review, adds to that. And again, it just gives this ascending spiral that keeps those same shows in the charts. So one of the things that we really look to solve with Podcast Magazine is not only sitting down then with the big folks who you already know and love, but really uh, have a heavy focus on people that you haven't heard of before and have these awesome shows that you should be listening to. And, and that's one of the things that we're super excited about with the Hot 50 uh, chart is that our it's kind of like Billboard, if you know how Billboard does the charts and the count, you know, that whole thing. Sure. Our chart is is built in, in, in a very different fashion. It's not based on like with Billboard, it's not based on sales or plays or spins or this, that, and the other. The only metric that we measure a podcast fans votes. So they come in, they stuff the ballot box and that's our chart. I, I love it. And we've seen this on iTunes already. So this, this show, of course, you know, we use Libsyn as our syndication platform. So we've seen week after week, and this is as we're recording this, October is the second month of the show. We've seen a 10% increase in downloads show after show after show. So, right, it starts at one number. The next show that comes out, we get 10% more downloads. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm not sure uh, if that is, you know, what that is a result of, I guess I should say. Um, if it's discoverability, if it's just us promoting it and continuing to promote it, if it's people listening and then now they're downloading additional episodes um, because the body of work uh, tends to increase. But I have found that, of course, it's going to be tough to break through. I, I feel like it's similar to those that start a YouTube channel and they want to see immediate results on their YouTube channel. It's just not going to happen. YouTube specifically, I know the platform rewards you over time. From podcasting, it seems to me, and I'd love to hear your thought on this, it seems to me that it is really up to the host to come up with his or her strategy on promoting the show to the audience they've already built or continues to build. And then in addition, if their guest wants to contribute to leverage the platform of the guest to talk about the, the shows that they've been on, which brings, which brings more listeners in. Aside from those two angles, which is the host doing the self-promotion and the guest making a mention that they were on that show, what are you seeing as ways where people can breakthrough. 
Yeah. And so it's a great point, Chad. And and frankly, it's it's a huge problem, right? It's a huge problem because when you look at someone like Will Ferrell and, you know, God bless his heart, he has the ability to do this. When Will Ferrell can appear on Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel and Stephen Colbert on the same night that he's dropping season two of the Ron Burgundy podcast, good luck competing with that. Right. I mean, just for 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 the majority of mere mortals who have podcasts, we don't have these huge networks behind us. We don't have these deep pockets. We don't have the ability to bounce people from one platform to the other. It's really tough to to compete in that game. And so even for those who are taking it upon themselves to ask their guests, you know, to share I mean, I can tell you from personal experience that it would have been a huge win if Katie Couric shared her cover appearance, right? I mean, we featured her on the cover of Podcast Magazine. You know how many email blasts she sent out to her list about her? You know how many social media posts she put out about being on the cover of Podcast Magazine? Any guess, Chad? I'm going to go with a big goose egg. That is correct, <laughs> right? So, so even in the case of, of having these big name people on, it's great from a credibility and authority standpoint, but it doesn't necessarily translate into anything in terms of more eyeballs and eardrums. Well, conversely, when you have a smaller show and you have smaller, quote unquote, smaller guests, even if they have 500 people on their mailing list or a thousand Twitter followers or whatever it might be, a lot of the smaller, and I hate to even use that term, even less popular, I hate to use that term, but the people that just don't have huge followings, you know, oftentimes they are so much more enthusiastic about sharing their appearances than those who have much larger followings, right? So, so yeah, that's a great way to, to start building your audience is to bring on people and even make it, you know, look, I, I will be the first to say that there are folks who insist that you share your appearance, right? And, and you know, I'm not one to put out demands to people, but I've seen it. And I've turned down a lot of interview opportunities because I say we got to mail our list three times. Well, I'm not mailing my list three times if I'm a guest on your show. It's just not going to happen. The opportunity cost is too great for us, right? So, so you got to find that balance of the people who can add value for you as a guest and are also enthusiastic and willing to share that appearance. So that's certainly one way. And then, you know, of course, it's, it's going to be on you uh, to, to be relentless. And, and one of the best ways, one of the best tips that I'll give to you, and, and this is not news, this is not rocket science, but as someone who's been in the game for as long as I've been in the game, what I will tell you is that the fastest way to grow a podcast is doing exactly what I'm doing now. Be on other to, podcasts. To be on other podcasts, period. It is, the, it is hands down the most cost-effective, time efficient. And, and, and even, you know, look, I mean, let's be honest, if you're going to do ads on Facebook or whatever, you, you know, you, you, you have time, energy and resources to go into all that. People who listen to podcasts, listen to podcasts. Yeah, I, I love it. And it does seem like it's the long game. If you want to do have one of those majorly popular podcasts, that said, there are people in very specific niches that you and I both know that may not have the huge download numbers that are doing just fine. And it is a huge asset for their business to have their podcast because they're making connections and they're doing business with their guests. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes podcast hosts seek out guests that they know they could provide a service to. And at the end of that conversation with the guest, they stop recording and they're like, Hey, you know, and they talk about services and and it probably goes in both directions. Yeah. I mean, the guest equal client, guest equals client approach is something that uh, we used to help and we still help actually uh, people launch their own shows. So the, the guy who was helping us, his name is Doug Sandler. He's got a great show called The Nice Guys on Business. He was part of our team for a while. He actually introduced me to the guest equals client concept. And the, the thing that I teach, Chad, and the thing to really think about, and whether it's a podcast or it's a, it's a vidcast or it's a blog or whatever it is, the thing to really think about and focus on are five specific words. And the five words that I ask people to really think about are these words, which are everything starts with the offer, right? 
And so the idea here is just have have clarity on, on, on what we call your profit path. In other words, have clarity on what happens when somebody becomes familiar with who you are, they want to know more about who you are, they come into your ecosystem, and then the process of indoctrinating them into your world so that they want to invest in relevant products, programs, or services, understanding that there's probably a step one on that path and ultimately a last step on that profit path. And so the idea here is to really begin, as Stephen Covey would say, right, begin with that end in mind and know what the last step is on your profit path so that you can work backwards from that. And to that end, depending on what that product, product program, service, or offering is, you can then create a show that best supports that initiative and best supports that goal. And, and frankly, you, you may not need to have a, a quote unquote popular show if you're able to have conversations either with listeners or with guests and one out of every five people that you chat with says yes to whatever that is. And for you, that's a, a $50,000 offering. I mean, come on, you close one of those a week and you've got a real business on your hands. Yeah, for sure. And a lot of people are having success with that strategy. Um, and, and it's it's awesome. I'd like to know this from you, Steve, as, as we bounce out of the podcast topic. At what point did you realize that you were a true bread entrepreneur? And what was what was that first business that you really sunk your teeth into? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I um, I am of the mindset. And so I, I put a book on the New York Times list called What Is Your What? Discover the One Amazing Thing You Were Born to Do. Uh, I'm of the mindset that your what has chosen you, and it's not that which you have chosen. So to that end, I'm of the mindset of entrepreneurs are, are born. They cannot be made. And so it's a special breed. Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is it takes a special breed to be an entrepreneur. I'm not saying you can't do entrepreneurial things, but it's either in your DNA or it's not. And for me, it's always been in my DNA to be an entrepreneur. I mean, I've, I've had just a handful of jobs over the course of my career where someone actually paid me to do a particular task in terms of, you know, getting a, a paycheck very few times. And so... And and when I'm talking about like I'm talking way back, like busing or you know waiting tables or doing you know that sort of stuff as a kid, working in an auto shop or or whatever. But reality for me is, as soon as I found DJing in terms of spinning in clubs and and playing music and all that fun stuff, as soon as I found DJing, right out of the you know right from that point forward, I knew that I was going to be an entrepreneur because even as a DJ going out and selling my services and, and getting paid to DJ. Technically, it's an entrepreneur if you come right down to it because it's my own company that I'm selling. It, albeit, you know, that can you can look at it and go, well, you're just an employee. You're just selling DJ services. But to me, it was about creating my own company. It was about really having the ability to control my own schedule. And I think ultimately, that's the biggest difference between someone who is an entrepreneur and someone who isn't, is at the end of the day, can you control your own schedule? And if you can control your own schedule and make money and do what you want to do, you're an entrepreneur. So from there, I went ahead and said, you know what? I've had a lot of great success as an entrepreneur. I'm 19 years old, man. I have I have hit the I've hit the pinnacle of my career here. This is, you know, I know everything I need to know here. I am brilliant at 19 and said, you know what? Let me let me go ahead and open up my own nightclub, uh, which is what I did. And so at 19, I opened up my own club. And, and literally from that point forward, there, there was no way I was going to be working for anybody. Yeah. What was, was that the first big hit, the club? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we raised capital for it. I wrote a business plan. I actually got the, uh, the, I had one investor and that investor actually happened to be my accounting professor in college. And so um, that was, that was the first real entrepreneurial endeavor. Uh, and it went really well for, for a, for a period of time. And then ultimately like any endeavor run by a, you know, a 19, 20 year old kid, we hit our bumps in the road and, uh, and eventually moved forward. But yeah, that was my first real entrepreneurial endeavor. And yeah, we raised money and, uh, and signed on a loan and closed the club and had to pay the loan back. And <laughs> so, so yeah, the whole risk reward, man, I, I got that just 
smack in the face right out of the gate. I'll tell you what, the sooner in an entrepreneurial journey that you can get smacked in the face and wake up and say, you know what? I learned a lot. I'm going to do it again. And I know what not to do this time. And mm-hmm. then you're going to do something else and you're going to find other things that you're going to learn what not to do next time. And mm-hmm. we're going to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And, and that if you don't love that part of the game, <laughs> then uh, then it's really easy to self-select out of it uh, because it's, it's not for everyone. Um, it, it's for it's for a select few um, that have the stomach for the for the roller coaster that is entrepreneurship, yeah. especially the day and age, uh, the COVID era that that we're living in right now. In your bio, you mention liquor.com. Um, what was what was the impetus for for wanting to launch liquor.com? Yeah, so my grandfather actually started in the liquor business. Uh, way back in the, in the in the early 1940s in Chicago, and my mom uh, went to work for my grandfather after my parents split, and so uh, by the time I got done with the club and that had kind of run its course, there were some needs that we had back home with the family business, uh, and so we were again in the in the liquor industry, and there was a very small piece of that puzzle. That was called Foremost, because that was the name of the franchise, Foremost Liquor Stores. Um, And so this was a very small piece of the puzzle called Foremost Liquor by Wire. And basically, if you think about FTD and how FTD would arrange for delivery of flowers, you know, those sort of things on a local basis through local retailers, that was the same general concept of what uh, Liquor by Wire was at the time. And so it, it was just, again, this very small piece of the puzzle. They had a, an 800 number, a, a Watts line, as we called it way back in the day. Uh, and on a very rare occasion, like maybe once every three days, that Watts line would ring. People, you know, The team would pick up and then they'd say, hey, I'm in New York. I want to send a bottle of champagne to, to my friend in California who just closed this big deal. And we'd write everything down and call our local California retailer and then the, the retailer would deliver that, right? So that's how it was structured. It helped us to get along around a lot of the can't ship liquor across state lines kind of crap that we don't need to go into details on. Uh, but when I looked at that and I saw everything else that was going on and it was 1991 uh, when I decided to, to, to come in and really try to do what I could do with, with this family business, that was the piece that I thought had the most potential. And so between 91 and 94, we started to build Liquor by Wire. And eventually in 94, we sold off everything except Liquor by Wire. And so during that time, we had launched a store on CompuServe's electronic mall. We built a fully functional e-commerce site from scratch in 95. Uh, And then around 98 or so, I started looking around and I found Liquor.com. And we had the opportunity to buy Liquor.com and Bourbon.com for $7,500. And it was like, hmm, you know, that's a pretty big stretch for a small-ish company. But in the end, I felt like it was worth the the risk. But I'm not going to sit here and say that if I had my druthers, that I would have gone into the liquor business on my own. I've never been a a big drinker. I'm, you know, I'll have a drink here and there, but I've never been like I don't have a love. You know, I'm not a connoisseur. Like, I'm not one of those guys that's got my, you know, my home bar and I'm lighting flames and fog out of, you know, round ice cubes, you know, all that stuff. Like, that's, I'm not doing it. Um, so I, I literally only went into it because I was asked to help with the family business. And, and we did, you know, we, we, we worked together on it. My mom and I worked together on it. My grandfather passed in 94, right after we sold everything. Uh, and my mom and I worked together, uh, for almost nine years, had the S one filed. We were ready to go public in uh, March of 2000. And uh, of course that's when everything oh. imploded. Yeah. Then boom. Uh, so what happened after? So, so we don't go public, but liquor.com is still doing business. Yes. Yeah. And it was one of those things where we were a real company doing real revenue with real profits. And we felt like if we could take the company public, it would give us the opportunity to raise some needed capital, to throw it into marketing and just really get more people familiar with what we were doing. Because at the time, it just wasn't as easy as it is now to get found online and to do you know all the fun stuff that you, know, you guys do on the regular. So 
it was um, it was difficult because I I was part of the process of pre IPO. We brought in all of these lettered saviors that Wall Street wanted to see. You know, they wanted to see a CEO and a CTO and a CMO and a CFO and a WTF, you know, and all these people. And like we bought into that hook, line and sinker, man. We even signed away our management rights. Mom and I both signed away our management rights to the company so we could bring in all these people. And of course, as an entrepreneur, you know, I just I'm I'm man, I'm not great when, when I don't have control. Like I, I know myself well enough to know that it's, it's far too often. Let me just say that I, I am difficult to get along with if we don't agree, if we agree, you know, the, the world is our oyster, but if, if we, if we don't agree, which I did not agree with how the CEO was leading things with how, you know, the CFO was looking at things and, and so on. I, I literally walked away, man. Right after the uh, the S one uh, was filed, right after everything imploded in the in the first bubble, there, I, I walked away from everything after nine years, and um, and it was hard to do. But literally walked away. My mom stayed on for about another six months, and then ultimately everything folded, and I walked away from everything, including the domain that at that point I still technically owned the rights to it. And um, yeah, I got into real estate development right after that because that was you know the next opportunity, and ended up developing about fifty odd million in property uh, over the next seven eight years. And ironically enough, uh, I re I reclaimed the uh, Liquor dot com domain in uh, in in around two thousand seven, and uh, put it up for sale right away. Had some buyers actually finally uh, signed a contract with someone who bought it for four and a quarter million. And uh, so, you know, I'd like to say it was a Cinderella story, but the guy made the first few payments, then bailed on the rest. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I kept the money and I kept the domain and on we go to version 2.0 and then 3.0. And ultimately, uh, we sold to Barry Diller's company, IAC, in 2019. Uh, but by that time, for years, I had just been involved on a board level. I didn't have any active day to day with it. And, um, you know, I'd like to say I got a huge paycheck and this, you know, this big bucket of gold. Uh, when we sold to IAC, but we were lucky just to pay the folks that came in in the first couple of rounds, uh, and there was nothing left for me or the common uh, by the time we got all said and done. So onwards, and here we go. Uh, that's a heck of a story. Uh, that's a heck of a story. I was going to say, it does sound like a seven-figure domain name, and it was valued. Oh, on its own, it was. It was valued for sure. Uh, oh, yeah. So you've seen a lot, uh, clearly. I'm curious, what has been your favorite of all the children? Uh, that you've been mm. able to give your your entrepreneurial birth to o- over the years, what what really lit the fire under you? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and I, I will say that you know the club was was a lot of fun from the standpoint of just having this idea, and it was the first time that I that I had an idea for something and put all of the pieces together to make it happen. And, and I think as an entrepreneur, when you're able to do that successfully the first time, it's really tough to, to replicate that feeling. Because just like in jujitsu, I've been doing jujitsu for about 20 years. And I have, a, I have a very unsafe level of confidence <laughs> in the real world as it comes, you know, because I've been doing it for 20 years, right? So in, in jujitsu, you have this sort of vacuum where there's rules and, and you do what you do. And on, in, in that environment, I can do really well. But, you know, reality is it doesn't always translate to the real world where there are no rules, right? So I think that that's kind of what happens, though, as it relates to the the world of entrepreneurship is to some extent, we get an unsafe level of confidence about being able to bring something to fruition, which frankly, you have to have (laughs) because there's no reason on God's green earth that anyone should just be able to do what we do as entrepreneurs. And, and what I love doing, Chad, and maybe you do this as well as someone who has such a marketing mind. I know how brilliant you are around all of this. I get in the habit of looking at things like even on my desk and even the desk itself and even the keyboard and the microphone and everything that I see, I, I am dangerously aware of the fact that everything that I'm looking at at one point didn't exist. And so it took an entrepreneur to sit there and come up with, Whatever it is, literally everything that you have in your world, an entrepreneur, and forget about the nature discussion, we're not going to get into all that, but literally everything that you have in your world at some point 
and entrepreneurs sat down and said, you know what? I think there's an opportunity here to create X, whatever that might be. And as you can see, a lot of that flies and a lot of it you know, falls, but it takes an unrealistic, a dangerous level of confidence to be an entrepreneur. So for me, long answer to your question, but having put all the pieces of the puzzle together, Chad, with the club, it gave me the confidence to be able to know that if I could do that once, and albeit it may not have, you know, again, buckets of cash or whatever, but just the ability to bring that to fruition, having that level of confidence has helped me to do absolutely everything else that I've done as an entrepreneur. Very well said. I, I'm with you. I do believe that there is something in the entrepreneurial makeup, whether it's an ignorance, it's, it, it's the, and when I say ignorance, it's the, I don't know what I don't know, so I'm just going to do it, and I'm not going to think about the consequences. Um, that that is there, and it's also, um, and I've given a bunch of, of thoughts to this. So I'm so happy we're having this conversation. But there's also the you know fight versus flight um, instinct that I believe entrepreneurs they they lack the flight end of it. It's mm. I'm not going to fly away. I'm going to go head in. And I believe in this so much. There's nothing that's going to stop me from, from bringing my idea to life. So mm -hmm. I think it's like the combination of those two things where it's like ignorance is bliss. Plus I don't have the flight part of the fight versus flight that, that propels us forward to create the things that we create. Yeah. And, and I'll say it's also the, the, there is a fine line. There has to be a delineation between when, you know, our, our, our being sort of obtuse around these things and, 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 and just being so, uh, again, dangerously confident about what's possible actually works to our, to, works to our disadvantage, oh, right? Yeah. Because, you know, you, you see that all the time with people who pump in another million dollars or $10 million or a hundred million dollars or $10 or whatever it should be into something that really needed to die on the vine. Right. And so it, it's a double-edged sword, because sometimes we're so, again, danger dangerously, dangerously confident and optimistic about what we're doing that we sometimes miss the even greater opportunities that are sitting right there. But we're trying to revive and, you know, really bring to life this this baby, if you will, that we've that we've, you know, birthed and, and fed and, and, and just tried to grow into this amazing thing. And and sometimes it's just, you know, it's just never going to get there. Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, all right, I've got three quick questions for you, and, uh, and then we'll bring this home, Steve. I'd like to know, and we got we got our cue cards ready to go for, for the people nice. watching on video. Um, who is one person that inspires you? Hmm. Yeah, it, you know, it's it's a great question, uh, and then there's the the the, the business side uh, of the equation, and there's the personal side. Uh, of the equation for for this conversation, um, I will stick with the the business side, and also it crosses over into personal um, because the person that continues to inspire me on a daily basis is actually the man that you see in the back corner here, uh, who is my grandfather. And so, being able to to work with with Grandpa for three years uh, before he passed, and and being able to hear his voice in my head, uh, who I talk to often about things. Uh, it's, 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 um, it's, it's a rare family that, that gets to work together to begin with. And then it's even rarer for three generations to be able to work together, uh, as we did for, uh, you know, for, for a handful of years there. And so, uh, just being able to learn from him and knowing what he was contending with, first to start the business and then over the years uh, and just so many battles that he had to to fight as an entrepreneur, but still did so always with um, a smile. I mean, he was literally one of the happiest people that, that I've ever known. And so having a chance to see what he was contending with on, on a business level and then knowing that so much of that he was coming home with, but still then being the man that he was for me throughout his entire life, uh, that, that voice still continues to inspire me. Number two, name a cool tool or an app or an extension that you're hot on right now. Mm. 
Uh, that is always the wrong question to ask me. <laughs> Only because you like I um, say it again. Is it because you like the shiny object and there's always something new or you don't use tools at all? It's because I am one of those old school guys. I mean, I, I still put together basic spreadsheets. I still, you know, keep journals with pen and paper. Um, so I, I wish I had just some some crazy hack to to offer you. Um, on the personal side, uh, what I will say is one of the things that has been an absolute godsend for me from uh, from a tool perspective. Uh, are the are the sleep apps like I really love um, the ability to turn on the sleep app just to to see how my sleep was to see when I'm getting just like all the, the like I've toyed with a few of them I actually really enjoy the the sleep apps and still use one every single night so that's if you're not using the sleep app they can be really really helpful sweet um, a book or podcast and we'll get to yours in a second um, but a book or podcast that you love and why yeah, you know, my wife turned me on to uh, a show called Something You Should Know, and it's uh, the the guy who hosts the show uh, is just he he brings on he does they do such a great job of finding people who are at the top of the game uh, in whatever their respective space is, and just he's got this 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 demeanor and this cadence that is just really really soothing. And so not only do you learn a lot, but I've actually uh, I've come to really enjoy his voice and and his pace and uh and I would say if you're not listening to to something you should know, uh it's it's a show worth checking out. Sweet. Steve, you got two podcasts that are going on right now. Tell us about those podcasts and how we could follow along. Yeah. So um, interestingly, and uh, this is, uh, I'm not saying it's confidential because it's something we announced publicly to our list, um, but maybe not something that you're familiar with. We're, we're actually uh, trying to walk the talk here a little bit around the medium from the standpoint of we are selling our shows as things sit here right now today. So we're actually in the process of selling both reinvention radio uh, and beyond eight figures. So the the honest truth is uh, those shows we're, we're looking to part ways with. We are launching shows uh, under the podcast magazine umbrella. Uh, the first show that we're launching that I'm super excited about is the Hot 50 Countdown, uh, which is our Casey Kasem American Top 40 style show uh, for, for the world of podcasts. So uh, that's by the time this airs, that, uh, that'll be live. So hopefully folks will, will check that out. But yeah, I appreciate it. But yeah, we're, we're parting ways, man. And we're going to actually teach people how to build and sell podcasts as part of what we do here. How to build and sell podcasts. So you grow an audience and then that becomes an asset. And then that becomes a channel that another brand would want to tap into. And they have this built in, uh, it's kind of like a software. If you think mm. about it, right. Is that the way you're thinking about it? Where it's like a yeah. software that builds a user base and then that software could sell to a larger company. And now, um, from a podcast standpoint, it's just more syndication. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'll keep you posted on how things go with that. But yeah, we um, we want to we want to make sure that we're we're trying to create uh, a really holistic uh, approach here to the medium. And, and part of what we do, and certainly what we do with uh, Beyond Eight Figures, is help people start, scale, and exit from businesses. Uh, and that's a lot of what we want to bring here to to the podcast mix as well as a as a concrete strategy and process for starting, scaling, and exiting from shows. So podcastmagazine.com is the domain. Is there a place where we could find more about Steve Olsher? Yeah, I mean, podcastmagazine.com forward slash free if you want to grab a free lifetime subscription. And we'd, of course, love to have you on that ride with us. Uh, but yeah, Steve Olsher, O-L-S-H-E-R.com uh, is always a great place to go. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on the Marketing On Demand show, Steve. Appreciate you having me. Hey, real quick, if you enjoyed this episode, please let me know by rating this podcast and leaving me an honest review. If you found this episode useful for your business, take a screenshot and tag me on Instagram at chadcollins.me and use hashtag marketing on demand. That way I'll be able to see it and repost it. I also created a guide of the top 40 ways people are using marketing on demand strategies and tactics in their businesses. And I want you to have it for free. Just text guide, G U I D E, to 90851, and I'll get it right over to you on demand. Until next time, I'm Chad Evan Collins, and this has been the Marketing On Demand Show.